Hey folks, it's Carrie, and I am with my good friend, Mike Canings. Mike, how are you doing today? Great. Really excited to be here. Excited about the topic. And oh, um, we were chatting a little bit before the cameras rolled, and uh, we got some good, good stuff cooking. Yeah, we do. So you're one of these guys who is always, in my opinion, on the cutting edge. And how do you think blockchain is is becoming more mainstream? Because years ago, it might have been like, ooh, who are those weird people? But blockchain, crypto, NFTs, smart contracts, why do you think it's hit mainstream? Well, statistically, it's still a long way off. When That's you look true. at the 8 billion people and 180 million or so, they say, are involved in crypto. And it is not without its problems. You know, I, I, I've, I've been reading some of the naysayers. So I'm going to answer your question, but I want to tell you what the negatives are, which are, I can remember... Um, it was in the 90s where I had a digital marketing agency called Digital Cafe. And things had evolved enough where we went from floppy disks to like removable hard disk drives. There was one called the Cyquist that hold 44 megabytes, okay, which was huge. <laughs> and they were very flawed. They got dust in them all the time and they broke. And then like I'd have a whole font library on them and it'd crash. And I'd be like, oh, my God, the, the work yeah. I had to do to get it back downloading on a modem you know it was before there was high high bandwidth sure and um <clears throat> we reached a point where we're developing multimedia applications digital movies um we did interactive movie projects and stuff like that and we had cd roms which hold 650 megabytes approximately that which back then was unbelievable because we yeah. could literally make an interactive click movie and then <clears throat> the web came along and it went, went to modems and postage stamp style graphics. And back then HTML was, and frankly still is crap compared to sure. um, writing real code. And like we were writing code, we were writing video games and suddenly we have to put stuff on the web and everyone's excited. Like 20th Century Fox and Sony says, use the, you know, we got to do websites. And I'm like, why? They suck, you know, yeah. it's horrible. So blockchain right now on a positive side, what NFTs and blockchain represent, our creators are going to get paid in ways we can't even imagine right now. And I, the example that comes to mind that's relevant to me right now for reasons I'll explain shortly are imagine you're a architect. Okay. <clears throat> and let's say that your fees to design a really beautiful, complicated work of art house would be $250,000. And uh, someone would come to you and say, hey, Mr. Architect, Look, we're glad to give you your 250. But if you'd like to put a little skin in the game, I'd like to pay you $25 million. Let me tell you how that's going to work. We'll give you a hundred grand now. You're going to license your plans through that. And then we're going to give you one half percent of the sales price of your $10 million homes your plans are going to be used for. We're going to create a whole bunch of them. You'll get a half percent, not just once, but every time that home ever sells. And based oh upon gosh. these comps, we think it's going to turn around three times in the next 10 years. And what would be great is the architect could say, okay, the smart contract's set up, so there's no escrow, there's no, um, all the traditional paperwork that goes on blows. Yep. And you could set it up so half of your fees after $10 million, for example, would start going to a, um, let's say a uh, nonprofit of your choice. Wow. And then 25% uh, would go to your kids um, broken down and divided into their trusts, which would also be crypto trusts, which would eliminate fees and attorneys and sign offs and, and having to have a, um, um, what do they call the person who checks to make sure oh, your signatures are. In uh, uh, oh, I know what you're talking about. It'll pop into our heads in a second. Yes. Notary. Notary pop. You know, it's like all this crap. Like yeah. we just refied our house and it took us an hour and they came in. I kid you not with a stack, this high of papers, right? some cases in duplicate and triplicate, but it's like, and this is for, and this is for, and yeah, it all has a purpose, but it's just like a bunch yeah. of attorneys covering their butts who made a whole bunch of money yeah. creating a whole bunch of noise because we can't trust. We don't trust because people screw you. People steal. 
And now there's all these systems in place. And it's like, well, in the world of blockchain, in the world of trust covenants and contracts and smart yes. contracts, it's not only unnecessary, it doesn't exist there anymore. Wow. Now, unfortunately, there is a utopian world we live in right now where um, most of the blockchain activities that are going on, it's just pyramid schemes. And there's a lot of shenanigans happening and a yeah. lot of dumb dumbs are going to lose money. A lot of people get in the game who don't understand what's going on and understand it's a shell game Ponzi scheme in a lot of ways. Um, so overall, I think crypto blockchain is inevitable. The fact is right now we're in the world of the 19 late 1980s, late 1990s, when you could write great code and things were really tight. And suddenly we're like writing on rocks again because the way blockchain works, it's super inefficient. It's super primitive. And there's a lot of unregulated stuff going on where there's theft and shenanigans going yeah. on at the same time. But the philosophy, what it represents is great. Man, I talked too long there, but I'm excited. No, no, no. no. That was awesome. To, to your point. Oh, my gosh. I've never heard that illustration of the plans. I mean, that's so positive that that this architect doesn't need to throw away their work of art and make that much. Instead, they make that much. But then whew, the upside. Oh, my gosh. I've never heard that. I was just on Instagram and someone pretending to be uh, an influencer. Even puts the pictures up. You know, basically said, hey, here's my blockchain address or here's my wallet, send this amount of money and immediately flags go up a little bit of di diving di uh, deeper. He's not who he says he is, but imagine a day, Mike, where because we do so much online with trust, I can press a button. And it says that that person is completely who they are. It says that they went to that school. It says that their transcripts are that it says that their GPA is that it says that they know who someone is that I know. I mean, we literally can flatten the world. What, what do you think? Yeah, I think the um, all of that and let's just take things another step of uh, like a practical implementable thing. So <clears throat> I, I happen to, I despise Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, TikTok. I think they're time wasting. Sure evils in general that have had a largely negative effect on society. Having said that, I don't say they're not useful. Sure. Okay? I love the fact that I can push a button and broadcast to the entire connected planet. I just think that bad people do bad things and they don't disclose it. We have a trust mm -hmm. issue again. And if you think about what real life is, so this is something I can't remember who said it. Oh, it was Dave Chappelle when he did his last um, big comedy special. And he got in a lot of trouble okay. with the uh, Alphabet Soup Society, meaning all the letters behind their names, okay, um, sure. which are a new form of psych psychic terrorism. You know, it's when the <laughs> oppressed becomes the oppressors. Um, <clears throat> now, again, I'm not saying all. I'm not saying always. Just saying we live in dangerous times of cancel culture where there are mobs of of individuals who can manipulate the system to get their way and then they become the oppressors. It's just a cycle. <clears throat> and the only real thing we have in our world, in the real world, not the Twitter world, is a reputation. Interesting. And what I would suggest we have is a true reputation online. Right now it's fake and you can do anything, you can be anything. But I mean, the real reputation. And it's like, oh yeah. Well, if we get really good, get canceled, it's sort of like, we can actually tell if people are telling the truth. I mean, we're getting to the point now where, you know, let's say you could just look and go, well, you're happen to like a certain former president who doesn't have a track record of telling the truth or doing good things. Okay. I'll just say as an example, <clears throat> and I'm not making a political statement. It's sort of like, look at the character. Right. Um, but, I could just simply say, and this is almost sounding sound like the, uh, what was the Black Widow? It's like a sci-fi uh, movie series, Black sure. Widow or something. Black Mirror. Black Mirror okay. is what it is. And the whole idea in there, there's this episode where uh, you have augmented reality vision and you could just turn someone off and suddenly you can't hear them and you can't see them. 
they're Whoa. literally disappear. But in the world of digital, if you'd say, look, someone who lies 50% of the time, anyone who lies 50% of the time, I will make it impossible for them to connect, communicate with me. And none of the information they create will actually ever show up in my view. Wow. Um, and make, that can all be managed disappear. on the blockchain. Pardon you me? Make, so like you made them disappear. I mean, that, that's, yep. yeah. And in the metaverse, that's entirely possible if you're wearing VR and AR goggles and that kind of thing. And again, for every positive, I think it's going to be incredible for education. I think it's going to be incredible for, um, you know, being able to do business, a new level of communication and intimacy. Um, I think in some cases, it's sort of like, is plastic surgery bad? No, I've seen it change lives. If you can get a couple extra miles out of your face and it changes the way you see yourself and the way you feel, and it gives you more energy, I'm all for it. Okay. I think the Kardashianism of the planet is bad. It's a bunch of fake lips, fake butts, and fake boobs isn't beneficial to society. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and in the world of, of AR and VR, what we're about to see, if you think addiction's a problem now, wait till you've got porn addiction in VR when you've got attachments to your bodies that uh, wrinkle and pinch and squeeze, et cetera, et cetera. We're going to have big problems um, and bigger ones, uh, as well as being able to stimulate the brain without chemicals, but get the same effects. Wow. Okay, there's, there are downsides and the transactions will take place completely digitally, right? With a Anonymous. crypto, with a token that has its own value. You know, we're operating where energy shift and movement is radical. So again, I believe ultimately it will be beneficial and good for society. I just think we've got to walk in with our eyes open and have a dialogue and a conversation. We've got to put education in our children first. And that wow. didn't happen. <laughs> Listen, you went deep fast, man. Um, so let me ask you this. Does technology outstrip our morality? Um, I mean, like, I, I, I don't I don't think anything is ever black and white. So okay. I'd present it like this. Is the world safer and better because of technology? There's no question, statistically speaking, we are. Is the quality of life better on this planet overall? There's tons of data flat out proving that's the case. Hmm. And, you know, I was just joking with my wife. We're making a little bit of uh, uh, in the kitchen together. Um, literally before I came on here and we had a gift that came in the mail okay. and it was wrapped with some thin film, single use Chinese plastic, you know, really crinkly, crunchy stuff. I mean, that's the stuff that's choking the planet right now, destroying our oceans, destroying our soil. And do we really need it? No. Um, is it unbelievably wasteful? Yes. And, I, can, I only have so much bandwidth each day to dedicate to feeling bad, okay? There you go. I, I, I can only control what I can control and how I feel. And the overall, our capability and ability to produce more food, have a higher quality of life, overall more dem democracy, um, I think is better. Do we lack from good journalism now? I, I You know, we, we've seen very little good journalism in quite a few years. Mm. The internet and hype and cancel culture and click to like and voting by likes by people who frankly shouldn't be given a vote because they haven't earned it. I say that again, it's not, I'm not trying to be an elitist. It's sort of like, I don't think stupid people should be able to move the moral fiber of a society. I think an education is necessary and important. And if you decide to consume Kardashianism, I don't think you should have a right to vote. You know, it's, it's like it's like putting on a stupid filter. You don't let a drunken three-year-old drive a car on a freeway. And that's what we have right now. We do have an abundance of that. Now, wow. if you're comparing to several thousand years ago, capability, you know what? It's probably better. Yeah. Who am I? Don't so, listen to me, you know? <laughs> I didn't think this would be a comedy show too, but I get both. I get content and comedy. Um, so your point is that technology will bring a big advantage. However, it will also give fuel to the people who are already jacked up and they'll be more jacked up. Yeah, I, I think, well, here's, I have an, 
philosophy <clears throat> that there's a certain percentage. I don't know exactly what it is. I think there are certain brain types that I think this is just an observable fact. Okay. Um, not a, not a philosophy. I think certain, some people are born addicts. Their, their brain chemistry suggests that they have a tendency towards that. Now, is it a sure. chemical imbalance? Maybe, but I've known people who exhibited bipolar disorder and under the scans and the maps, it's sort of like, yep, we can look at it. You know, there's a question as to whether sexuality is, uh, you know, if you're born a certain way, have a tendency. I think science suggests that Yes. Okay. It's more often than can say, let's say environmental or social conditioning. Um, <clears throat> and so I think, you know, humans are really, really complex and to boil one thing down and say, this is good. This is bad. Lacks the nuance of what the universe provides us, which is nuance Interesting. and there's subtlety and <clears throat> without subtlety and nuance and a conversation, there is no art. And I think that, Life does have a tendency to imitate art. <clears throat> I think pop culture is an example of that. I think any kind of trends, and if you look at something like the Beatles documentary that came out, that was an extraordinary masterpiece by Peter Jackson. And mm. what you got to witness over a period of nine hours, three three-hour segments, was what collaborative creation really looks like amongst wow. some geniuses who love each other and they've been together since they're 15 years old. They're about 30 here. It's their last real album together. And you yeah. could just tell they're tired and weary. And, and so everything goes through cycles. And I think we've reached a certain point of our technology platforms, the way we govern, um, and our capacity to reason and understand has grown considerably. All these things. There is a much needed change. And we get back to the whole concept of blockchain, governance, money, the perception of value. What this enables us to do is innovate really, really quickly. Mm. And there's a couple of podcasts I've listened to. One of them is called All In. Okay. Um, bunch of big Silicon Valley geniuses. They get together and they sim simply are saying, <clears throat> we are on the brink right now of what will become the largest renaissance in creators and creativism in human history. Wow. Not by a little bit, but by magnitudes because creators can get paid for who they are and, and not just once, but many, many times. And creation is a very complicated, big idea, right? Mm. I love it. I love it. So you're basically saying that the technology is allowing humanity to express something that they've always had creativity, but it was maybe reserved for the elite, but the technology allows us to really all step up to the plate. Yes. I'm going to give you a yes. And okay. right with a real practical example again of let's just pretend that, um, you're a great creator, but you're not a great executor. And I'll, I'll put it in the context of Star Wars as an example. It could be uh, a Harry Potter. It could be anything. But let's just pretend that you created the next big thing. And again, I'll use Star Wars as an example because sure. I heard this on a... Uh, and what you do is you'd say, hey, you get to be part of this franchise. Here's how it works. Um, <clears throat> you can create a democratically built series of shows. So it's kind of like creating fan fiction, a fan program. And in it, you're going to have editors and shooters and animators and writers. Okay. And we will license you our characters. Um, but of everything you, you make know that it's derivative content. 40% uh, of any money that gets made <clears throat> in distribution, et cetera, et cetera, goes back to us, 60% goes back to the community. And then again, you could set up these smart contracts. So um, there'd be distribution systems and um, it's kind of an advanced Hollywood model, but the whole idea is because it happens immediately, it doesn't require co complex stuff, but suddenly you feed the fans this content. 
Hmm. And they just go to work and create a whole new universe. But everyone gets to participate because it's democratic. Maybe there's some tools in it that decides what gets used, what doesn't. That's pretty, pretty interesting, right? Um, and again, for a creator, typically, if you created a piece of art, you get paid once, goes back. If you're lucky, you might find um, an individual who would be your patron and pay right. you a big lump sum and say, hey, I just want to hang out with you. It's basically a rich guy with no talent says, I want to <laughs> hang out with an artist, right? And be like, come on over, Mick Jagger. I'm rich. It's okay. the entourage, right? I want to be part yeah, of you. Very much. And so I think, again, that when you imagine that um, over the past two years during the the um, C word, P word, we had, um, that's very carefully masked, so the uh, gods of the internet don't flag this content. But, um, <laughs> you know, we've been able to operate and work virtually. And, you know, I think it's magnificent. I think yeah. it's awesome. We just, my wife and I just bought three and a half acres in Mexico in Total Santos. We're building homes down there, um, building a studio. We bought a strawberry field. Okay. So I'm calling wow. it Strawberry Field Studios. Oh, okay. and what do you think of that? That's pretty slick. And, um, but I'm going to do everything using blockchain. I'm not going to do anything using money any longer. It's only going to be, I'm going to only accept payment. Um, that's the way I'm doing business. I'm committed to it. And our goal is to build out systems that enable creators of any sort, whether it's business or art or content, to operate within this world. So I'm all in. I'm oh completely committed to it. And by the way, we're growing our own food and we're going to create a sustainable uh, space and put casitas on the property so farmers can live next to us. I mean, we're making a conscious effort to live in a responsible way and and instead of talk about it we're gonna do it wow wow um talk a little bit about mike and your wife because i've seen mm. I've seen your instagram i saw you you and you in mexico recently but you've written cancerpreneur your wife's part of a, a foundation give us the quick backstory because blockchain essentially is being dropped upon the canings and all these expressions are now optimized 10 X as Dan Sullivan, our friend says, talk to us about like, what is, who is Mike and, and, and tell me your wife's name. One more. Is it Vivian? Yeah, it's Vivian Glick. She actually still has her, her maiden last name. We married yeah. older in life That's and right. we went to the, went to the courthouse. She looked around and she's like, to become you is going to be like so much work. Would would it mean, does it mean you don't love me? I go, I don't care. As long yeah. as we get to name our kid, a cane eggs, I'm fine. There you but go. Uh, anyway, that was our, that was our bargain. But <clears throat> yeah. So you're just kind of looking for a little background around yeah, who we yeah, are. I mean, in case the fact never that you heard care about the planet, the fact that you care hmm. about overcoming cancer, you have this powerful story that you were given a death sentence and you clawed mm -hmm. back to purpose. It's amazing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think the um, well, her her backstory. We both have, you know, I, I believe everyone has an interesting story and an interesting background. Hers, she, her, she's the daughter of Holocaust survivors. Her mother's still alive, lives by herself. She's eighty nine years old, and in Queens, New York, um, she grew up in Spanish Harlem, and uh, was very very smart. Was fortunate enough, even though they're very poor, that her mother got her into some good schools. She wow. went to some basically some higher end prep schools in Manhattan, um, and then started college when she's sixteen years old. She so she graduated when she's nineteen, and after doing work in the healthcare space, healthcare marketing specifically, she went to run Deepak Chopra's marketing and events. So that got her connected with the whole personal development, personal growth, um, what I guess was called new age philosophy at the time. And um, it was because of that, that uh, we, we, uh, we met, I kind of met her through a combination of, because of some connections with Tony Robbins, my interest in Neil Donald Walsh and Deepak and Wayne Dyer had gone to, Egypt with Wayne and, and uh, Deepak the year before we met in Greece. Wow. So we got married, had a kid, ended up moving to San Diego. She opened up her network to me. And pretty soon I know all these same personal development gurus and 
worked with Tony and Wayne Dyer and Deepak and, um, uh, and then really did more with marketing some of the cla the old guys like Dan Kennedy and Brian Tracy and and um, Jay Abram and all those people yeah yeah Jay yeah doing a project with Jay right now in fact wow so um, and if you fast forward a little bit started you know a couple companies two software companies and then I had cancer I was diagnosed with stage three cancer and wow. um, part of the healing journey involved first of all I wrote my first book. And then that turned into a product where we taught people how to write books and, and publish and, and do kind of a mini version of what you're doing, more of a, uh, I'd That's say a great. mass market version, right? Yeah. Um, and then the, my last book I wrote is right here. It's called Cancerpreneur. Wow. And um, it's really the system I developed to survive. And, and it's really, if I were going to, subtitle it so the subtitle is how you your marriage family and business can survive and thrive a cancer diagnosis and treatments so number one i had no uh i couldn't find any support for entrepreneurs and business owners who had cancer there's literally nothing existed wow and i was like how do you run a business and maintain it and keep your family going answer so, i mean it was just an insurmountable wow man, that is a critical book <clears throat> yeah and i know it saved lives you know it's like if it saves if a book saves one life then it's worth it but um the next side was the way you do it is by hacking the healthcare system so i figured out how to apply my persuasion influence and uh direct response capabilities to keep my doctors super interested and give me five or ten times more attention than the average patient um, so, you know, the best way to be interesting is to be interested. And, um, it wasn't an act of manipulation. It was simply an act of so how do you create massive curiosity in the people who are taking care of you mm. and they reward your curiosity with intention and your compliance as well. So I became a very, very compliant patient. I did everything they said and a whole lot more. And I always showed up, you know, what all the doctors always laughed amongst themselves. They said, you're the only cancer patient who always shows up. He, the happiest person in our offices all the time. You're always laughing, joking. And, um, you know, this is, we're not used to seeing happy people. Oh so, my gosh. So you, you literally, I mean, I wrote a book called show up filled up, mm -hmm. but, but, you wrote you wrote a book called Cancerpreneur, where I love what you're saying. You basically became batteries included, as strategic coach says, mm -hmm, so that mm -hmm. all the health people were like, "Dang, we got to help this guy. We we, we got to help Mike survive." Because he became good for very us. very invested in, in Mike not dying. That is true. Wow. I hadn't thought of it quite like that, but that's very true. <laughs> that's interesting. But to this day, like I'm really good friends with my oncologist. Eight years later, I, I go to him. I see him frequently. He's, we, I mean, every time we come in, we laugh like little girls together. It's, it's hilarious. And um, the, the I ended up going to Duke, which is 2,500 miles from home here for radiation therapy. And my doctor was on the last couple of years of his career. And he, I was there during the holidays. So I was there for Thanksgiving and Christmas and New Year's. And of course, totally isolated. And he just treated me like a son. So, and I, I went over for parties at his house with Nobel laureates and um, oh uh, these incredible uh, people. And um, they were like, wait, 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 wait. Because, you know, I, I was skinny and gray and I lost most of my hair from the all the treatments and uh, you know, I couldn't taste anything. And I felt like I was carrying around a combination of broken, broken glass and lava in my innards all day. It was it was not fun. Wow. But um, they were very curious about my relationship with the doctor because, you know, typically you don't commiserate or have relationships with the doc. But he was um very invested in me and also um we liked each other yeah and it was very special i was um um hadn't thought about that in a long time gee that's powerful man so your wife has this foundation she yep. works with some of the best healers uh speakers influencers you apply your marketing techniques to cancer and write this hopeful book um where what are you doing today 
Well, <clears throat> about three years ago, after doing a lot of different things, I, um, I, I was depressed and, uh, and I couldn't explain why I just felt sad and I felt trapped. And I think I had committed the better share of my life to getting really good at threat response marketing and selling information products. And, uh, I spent a lot of time on stage doing a lot of events and spending a lot of money on Facebook and all that. And, um, I just couldn't sell another $2,000 information product. I couldn't do another webinar or another event. And at that point, um, right when I started feeling the sad, I had I was contracted with five hotels for events, which basically means you're screwed. If I would have tried to get out of them, they're going to sue you. They're going to win. And they're probably going to you know, get $250,000 out of me. So I had about a million and a half dollar problem for that. Probably another half a million to shut down the business if I wanted to quit. And then um, I had people working for me, right? So I felt responsibility, but I just felt trapped and mm. I just couldn't do it anymore. And, <clears throat> you know, if you fast forward six months, um, oh, and then all my marketing just quit working practically overnight. The agency I was working with failed and, and then another one quit um, without telling me, left my ads running. And I woke up one day, I was $150,000 upside down on my Amex card from uh, Facebook charges. Wow. Okay. So let's just say I wasn't happy. Um, <laughs> and, I, and, and on paper, I should have been, right? You know, I'm successful and have money and a beautiful wife and son and live in sunny California. I didn't feel worthy to feel sad, but depression is depression. It's not mm. nothing you could control. And sometimes it just is. And um, I really spent some time getting my spiritual center um, getting in the best shape of my life. I quit drinking any alcohol. I never had a big, you know, it's never, I never had a problem. I just sure. quit and I only did healthy things and um, figured out a way to reinvent, pull my way through while wrapping up the business with integrity. Meaning sure. I told Pretty all my strong. team, I did it yeah. elegantly. And then at the end of it, <clears throat> I was at a event speaking and I met someone who bought my business and all my products what? and then paid me a big sum of money to, to be an advisor for another year. So um, I managed to wrap up the business extremely profitably and sell it. And then um, it took about six months to just think. Um, Dan Sullivan gave me some really powerful advice and I opened up my heart and opened up my mind to do what happened next, which was I realized that what I love to do and I was hungry to do is a lot of my business was wide and shallow. I mean, I sold thousands of products to a whole bunch of people, but I never really got to be with them. Mm. And there were people I met and they'd say, Hey, what would it take for, for you to coach me? And I'm like, well, you can pick this or this or this or this. It was always, always a scaled model. And they're like, no, I want you. And I'd be like, I'm too busy on my own rat trap, teaching people how to not run on a rat trap to be able to be with you. And I'm like, I can't, I cannot be that way any longer. Wow. So I developed a business that I call the superpower accelerator to go narrow and deep with a small number of people. I, I, you know, my, my starting package starts at $75,000 and goes up from there. So it's a big investment for people. And I essentially build brands from scratch. I help people reinvent themselves, create businesses in three days. And it's a real hands-on, but very, very, satisfying you're good at it. model you're yeah we're very it. good at it. just last yeah. week i had a guy here who had sold his business to a private equity firm he's 61 he's got more cash in the bank than he could ever spend and he's got a lot more coming probably the tune of uh nine figures and um he yeah. doesn't know what he wants yeah well he's very, like very he's too young to quit and he knows better and he's like but i don't know what's going to turn me on and keep me joyful. And I said, I got an idea and I pitched him an idea. And he's like, that sounds awesome. When do we start? And I'm like, now. And he's like, okay. And in three days we invented his business, did all of his marketing content. Um, I partnered with him on it. So it's one of the few collaborations I'm doing. And now he's basically doing what he needed and what he wanted. So he got a, he owned a franchise company 
So he's the founder owner, sold it to a private equity firm. We did a little research. It's about 3,500 franchise companies in the United States. Well, I've got some really smart data scraper guys. We got all their contact information. We know exactly who they are, put together a pitch and an offer. And then we already interviewed several P private equity firms, PE firms, and he'll go in, consult, advise, help them grow, prepare them for an acquisition, and then introduce them to the private equity firm. And it's sort of like working like a translator. Entrepreneurs don't know how to, know how to talk to PE firms. PE firms know how to talk to entrepreneurs, but they got a problem. Mm. Right now, there's too much competition out there buying them. It takes a lot of time, a lot of money to screen the business. And um, money's cheap. So everything's way overpriced. So what we do is we're matchmakers but we help the businesses grow and come to the PE firm. So they're ready to get acquired really fast because PE firms, the problem with due diligence, it takes a year. What if we can shorten that by half? So it's well, massively asked, valuable. And so could, we built the whole business and all the content in three days. And I know you, I know you do that. Well, I've seen you do it. Do you think just to bring it full back, full scale back, do you yeah. think blockchain mm -hmm. will be part of you superpower accelerator or the private equity will that shorten the gap of the verification yeah, yeah th definitely i think um <clears throat> for one thing i think what you're going to continue to see is this notion of um a business being able to realize generating income through a whole bunch of different ways. So let, I'll give you a real life example again, and then I'll adapt it to the blockchain. So sure. with Joey, here's the basic idea. He can get paid by the business to workshop them into being prepared. So let's say a two or three day experience, just like what I do. It's a one-on-one -on -one workshop experience. Then part two is you can get paid a percentage of increased revenues. So I call it a baseline plus model. The third way is to get um, phantom stock or equity. That way there isn't a tax issue, but when the business sells, here's an upside. And then a private equity firm can pay for access to deals, subscription-based, okay? Then the PE firm can pay him a percentage of the deal and then give him a back-end deal as well, okay? What they call the second bite of the apple. And then there's another way where he can um, assist in helping a business, let's say, monetize their IP. And there's other strategies as well. So there were seven different ways of getting paid. Now, I think in the world of blockchain, what's happening now is this idea of certain businesses can create their own token. In other words, their own currency for trading or rewarding their customers. Yeah, it's just like miles, right? Except that token can be exchangeable in a similar business. So it's, it's kind of like barter, except it's faster, it's easier. And again, with smart contracts, you can verify identity, you can verify behavior. Um, and then there's the utility as well. So we can re-examine businesses and say, maybe there's something more here than a service. Maybe what your intellectual property is doing can have secondary or tertiary value wow. um, to other industries. So, um, you know, I'm... I've got a couple big projects I'm working on right now. Um, I have two clients that are actually in space. So one of them launches rockets using glider technology and tow lines and basically missiles. Um, I've been an advisor for them and an investor for a couple of years. The second one is putting uh, supercomputers in space. It's one of the biggest problems in the world right now with um, is power, heat, and security. Well, if you're in space, you get unlimited power. You're anytime you're pointing on the opposite side of the sun, it's really, really cold. And then you can make things absolutely positively secure up there. So you can, you know, shoot a bunch of data up with like a laser encoded technology or keep everything in space, process it, and then send it back down. So <laughs> they're about to launch in uh, July on the ISS. Um, and we just had a board meeting yesterday. So um, imagine being able to tokenize that. So you'd say, hey, I, I need secure computing. Well, then you buy this token and that's good for something. And by the way, we're making something of value. You've heard of how people are storing electricity as Bitcoin, for example. So I could make Bitcoin 
in a, yeah in let's say next to a waterfall in uh zabanga wanga wanga over in whoever country right where i'm paying one fifth or one tenth for the current over there and mine bitcoin okay and then i'm storing energy i'm storing power that's kind of interesting isn't it and then i can move that bitcoin and i could buy energy i could buy power i could influence a politician or a government with that minted power okay oh. and i could buy it at a discount but that doesn't make your head spin around a hundred different ways <laughs> okay now i can create derivatives meaning there are other ways i can create value and convert it into electricity or the ability to influence or persuade. Then you an know official. what's funny. You know what's funny yeah. about all this. Twenty years ago, I saw. Um, well, yesterday I saw Bill Gates talking. I think it was to Letterman, and, mm. Letter, and Letterman was kind of like mocking him about, um, you mm -hmm. know, hey Bill, so we can watch a baseball game on a computer. Sounds <laughs> sounds like radio. You know, you know, like he was mocking yeah. him and, and Bill was cool with it, but people are going to watch this live stream today, which sounds so out there. And in five years, they're going to watch it and be like, yep. It's like going to a picnic. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They're going to be like, let's drink dude, some beer out of a keg. Yeah. In my what, pickup truck. What, what were, yeah. You know, what was so deep with Carrie and Mike that day? Uh, they finally get it, you know? So that's, what's nuts. I mean, we are looking over the edge of this new world, mm -hmm. and yet we're escalating so fast. Um, I had Pete, our friend from Strategic Coach, on earlier today. You know, Pete um, COVID, mm -hmm. um, and with blockchain, and uh, yeah. you know what I love about this show. You're an expert, and then we look at blockchain. Pete's an expert, and we look at blockchain, but all from different angles. Um. I don't know how to wrap this thing up today. All I'm saying is, Mike, how can people who want the Superpower Accelerator, mm -hmm. want the Cancerpreneur book, want mm. all the things that you shared, how can people find out more about you? Sure. Well, you can learn more about the book. Just go to cancerpreneur.com or just get it on Amazon. I purposely price it at like as low as I can make it because I just want people to get it for people so who good. need it, right? So but it's good. also a great preventative measure because at some point, either you or someone you know will have cancer. Okay, that's wow. just the statistical fact. And there's a high probability that it's going to be um, something like colorectal cancer, which I had, which is a horrible place to have it. I have, mm. I have half my gut. So I have half a colon, half a rectum. I do have a normal life. But boy, oh boy, I do not have, let's just put it this way. Um, I have no room for margin. <laughs> if I have, uh, if I got to go, I got to go and there ain't no holding in the gas. If there's uh it's just the bags ain't there any longer. There you uh, go. There we go. We, we weren't going to get by without a fart joke, but, hey. um, um, but the other thing you can do, you can learn more about superpower accelerator and go to, um, my website, which is paid for life.com slash go. And on that page is a video. It's like a documentary video of like a before, during, after, and some testimonials. But it's like Exciting our process. Watch. Yeah. Yeah. And then um, <clears throat> Dan Sullivan is in there. A um, couple of really fantastic people just talking about the, what their experience is like. Um, and a mutual client, one of our uh, good friends, Mr. Justin Donald, who oh, yeah. uh, lifestyle investor. Oh, okay? yeah. This is, I think, to, you know, if there is ever was our greatest collaboration. It's, yes. it's with him in terms of raw success and um, where he's gone. So glad you connected S us uh, all together. Yeah. It's fantastic. Yeah, you got a couple more in, in the uh, shoot right now. I hope yeah. they're uh, edges away or they've already yes. closed. So, But um, yeah, so I think that's the key thing. And um, uh, if you want to write to me, it's just my name, Mike Koenigs at gmail.com. It'll, it'll get to me and, and you know, there's something I can do to provide some value. I can definitely follow up with um, some great content. There's a yes. lot of videos. I have two podcasts, one with Dan Sullivan, Capability Amplifier. Let's see here. Mm, boo, boo, doo, 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 doo. I thought maybe I had I had the wrong remote in front of me, That's but right. uh, 
You anyway, got uh, tricked out with the screen now. Yeah, totally. Capability amplifier are the big leap with Kay Hendrix. That's awesome. Well, you are seriously one of the uh, smartest people I know. And, and mm. I think people can be different types of smart. And I mean that as a compliment, you know, LeBron James, smart kinesthetically. You got your, your smart um, just from a value creation. I don't know if anyone's ever told you that, but you hmm, can look thanks. at somebody, you can look at somebody and say, hmm, this person has no self-awareness, but here's how they can create value in the marketplace. Maybe there's something there, man. Um, yeah. But uh, but thank you for being here. And uh, no, thanks for the thanks invitation. For and mind, you, yeah, the answer is always yes, Carrie. You know that. That's right. Um, That's right. So whatever, whatever I can do, I, I think. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you one little side note. I know you're collaborating right now with Lee Richter. I was just with her this weekend at the French Laundry in Napa. So it was wow. the first time I went to that. And it was another mind-blowing experience, which here you've got a popular restaurant. They could create NFTs and do blockchain stuff and create their own currency. Um, all, all around a vineyard? Uh, in this case, uh, around experiential eating. Uh, they have their own farm. They make their own food. They have a huge kitchen. I, just to put it in perspective, and we got in there for a bargain. Um, so a multi-course meal with um, wine and everything, it was like 900 bucks a person. Oh, my God. Okay? And the only reason it was that cheap was because Lee brought $20,000 worth of wine that we drank from her own. Yeah, it's 150 bucks a bottle of corkage. So, um, and, and like everything you eat is this tiny, tiny little thing, but extraordinary, like it was it once impossible long. to comprehend. Yeah. yeah. So there's like, for example, a dish that's, um, oysters and pearls. So it's, uh, an Australian tiny oyster in a certain kind of, a uh, tapioca, something, something base, and then a dollop of a very rare um caviar i mean th this little tiny taste probably was like <laughs> you know it's 100 bucks worth of caviar and then whatever right. it's like 200 bucks just for that thing you know is that kind right. of that's that's what it's like and um um i think being able to bring experiences to people in multiple forms is is a new v form of value creation it's it's causing us to slice up every you know, yeah. yeah, everything is changing and, and it's all happening with an idea. Um, it's a great time to be alive. So I think it's the best time ever to be alive. Yeah. I, uh, I'm, I'm convinced of it. I'm, I'm excited for what's going to come next, but I'm not, I don't feel like uh, it's, I, I neither want to put the brakes on, nor do I want to go any faster than there you we're go. going. Yeah, and, you don't have to rush so, to get there. Enjoy it. Yeah. And I do yeah. think that, um, you know, our opportunity to live anywhere in the world, communicate anywhere in the world, be untethered and then be able to be rewarded in alternate interesting ways um, without being tied to a specific government or a currency. It's going to force governments to rethink the perceived value that they're providing Ooh. that goes beyond terrorizing uh, its citizens and businesses that are inside it. Like I live in a terrorist state, business hostile <laughs> state of California. Now, it turns out that the trade-off for the quality of life, it's still high. Yeah. But I did just buy property in Mexico. That's right. I do qualify immediately to be a permanent resident. You know, That's I'm so all cool. about opportunities, options, and freedom. And it's my intention, you know, to, to get an EU passport as well. I'd rather be a world citizen than a country citizen interesting um so, our, citizen our, so our next show is the validity of uh, a government related to uh blockchain you know we'll talk about that about yeah that. that's a that's a great topic i've spent a considerable amount of thought thinking about that's it and by the time we speak i'll uh i'll have some more I, I i literally have been deep diving on that very topic just this past two weeks i love um, it very interesting again this notion of what is energy what is power what is freedom what is sovereignty exactly that that is an evolved conversation it's mm. not it's not black and white so um looking forward great to job 
Hey, I, I love you. Ask great questions. You're an excellent interviewer. Well, and thank uh, you. This is this uh, is. Uh, I'll, I'll just close with this. I I killed my uh, podcast of seven years called the Igniting Soul Show because I wanted to move into this area with you and a few other influencers, blockchain. And uh, just like when you said, hey, you had this great business and yet you needed to go somewhere else. I mean, that I feel like I'm reinventing myself. You're reinventing yourself and Superpower Accelerator is literally the program that reinvents people. Yeah, no, that's very true. Yeah, All right, man. thanks. That was you a fabulous, a shameless plug. I have to. You've you've helped me out a ton, and I believe in you. Huh? The same. Thanks. All right, thanks man. a lot.